Genesis Foundation. Welcome to the Quarantine Tapes, a daily podcast from Onassis LA and Dub Lab. Hosted by Paul Holden Graber, this series chronicles shifting paradigms in the era of social distancing. Hello, could I please speak with Min Jin Lee? This, this is she. How are you, Paul? Min Jin, it's such a pleasure to to speak with you. How am I? I I'm alive. Yeah. I'm alive. I am very, very pleased to have you on the quarantine tapes. I felt that your voice was essential. And so I'm oh. I'm, I'm tremendously happy that you accepted to take my call and be part of of this adventure in these dire, dark, delirious times we're living through. Unprecedented, really, it's not a word one likes using often, but it feels that way. I've never lived something that has had such a global impact. Have you? No, no, and it's odd. First of all, I'm really glad that to be speaking with you because I knew that this would be a real conversation. Well, thank you. And nothing, and nothing falls. And because it's been really hard to actually talk to people on the phone because I'm not so good at equivocating and um, acting as if everything is okay. Because I find, I don't know how you find it. I find that I have these waves, like I'll, I'll feel okay and I'll feel calm. And then all of a sudden the sirens will start because I live in Harlem and I'm living in New York, which is the epicenter of the world right now in terms of where there's the greatest amount of cases and devastation. And also it just feels so completely out of control. And then, so I'm in my house and I'm with my family and I feel physically well, but then the sirens never end. So I have earplugs in all the time because I found that, I was feeling too sad and I couldn't function. But then, you know, I'll be in a moment, I'll be with my family in the kitchen, I won't wear my earplugs. And I feel happy because I see I'm having a delicious meal or because my son made a funny joke. And then all of a sudden I feel guilty because, oh, how could I be happy when people are dying around me, like just everywhere, and I don't see an ending to this so that's anyway i'm glad to be speaking with you because i know you understand and talk to me about the sadness um well i was in new york city and i was evacuated when 9 11 occurred because i live downtown i was maybe eight blocks away from the world trade center when the tower fell i remember you talking so about I re- that Yes, I was there. And then when the Tohoku earthquake happened in Japan, I was in Tokyo. And then I had to leave two days after it had happened with my son. And so I kind of felt like, and then of course my father's a war refugee from North Korea. So I kind of thought, you know, I am fairly nimble at dealing with crisis. Like I always know where my passport is. I always have cash in the house. And like, there's a kind of like a hoarding mentality of me anyway. But this, this is so different than anything I have ever witnessed. And I've researched wars like very extensively for decades. So I don't know, there's a kind of perniciousness to this. And um, I feel so humbled by it. I feel truly humbled by the magnitude of this challenge. It's an interesting word uh, for you to use, I find the word humbled, because when I think of Min Jin Lee, I think of someone who has a great laugh, a great sense of humor, a great sense of joy, but also is very humble. 
So Min Jin Lee is humbled doubly so, it would seem, by by these events. And I'm wondering, are you still reading a chapter of the Bible every morning? I do, six days a week. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have OCD, depression, and anxiety. <laughs> and in order for me to work, like one of the things I figured out is that I had to have a routine for the past 25 years. I do a very exhaustive understanding of the Bible, and I read it as literature, I read it as art, I also read it in terms of my faith practices, and I have a kind of a dialogue with what I understand of the Bible, because there's so much of it that troubles me. So, yeah, this morning was chapter 49 of Genesis, because I've this is now my sixth time, like that's my sixth actual round of reading the entire Bible. So... I'm on, and this is a story of Joseph, and it's actually one of my very, very, very favorite stories in the entire Bible because it's all about the meaning of suffering. Like when you are betrayed and when you are sold by your brothers into slavery and somehow when you are sent to jail unfairly and then later on you somehow become the right-hand person of the Pharaoh, is it possible that this could have happened, all of this tragedy, because you were meant to save your people? And I think... Wow, that's a crazy story. It's an incredibly crazy story, and yet also quite beautiful. So, yeah, that was this morning. There, there are these two moments of 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 beauty and craziness. I've I've heard you said that you'd pull a verse um, sometimes down to console you, but also it often troubled you. You wondered why is it there? Yeah, why do people have to suffer famine? You know, because that is part of the story. Like, the brothers have to come back from Canaan, and they approach Joseph, their brother, whom they sold into slavery, and say, oh, can we buy food? And and they only come, and they come under great duress from their father, who never favored them. And they have to turn to this person, who they don't even know is their brother, and buy food because the entire land is experiencing famine. And right now, as we have global pestilence and we are having global famine occurring. I mean, in New York City, people yeah. are running out of food in food banks. So now I'm saying, like, wow, in my lifetime, I'm actually witnessing famine in the wealthiest country in the world. How crazy is that? How crazy is um, that? And, and I guess that's the reason why I do feel humble, because I think, like, wow, if I could get on my knees and pray that this could end. I, w- I mean, do you know what I mean? Like, it's that level of, I don't know what it would take. I don't know what it would take. And for those who don't believe in God, I completely respect that too. Um, I, I, it's just so, so infuriating. And then, of course, I, I teach at a college and I think about my students. Like, how do you explain this to young people? How do you explain right? it to young people? How do you explain it to your children? How do you, mm-hmm. how, do, how, how, how? And, and, and Min Jin, these are the questions that have always occupied you, the, these big questions of how is this possible? What is the meaning of all this? Is there a meaning to this pandemic? I hope there is a meaning to it because otherwise it would be just um, maddening. And I, and I worry about that a great deal because even before the pandemic, I felt very strongly that Generation Z, very optimistic and very beautiful generation, like really truly progressive and very good kids, and they're having their hearts broken, and they're experiencing so much anxiety anyway. So you have this bizarre optimism because they're so progressive, and yet they and idealism, and they also have this intense, intense anxiety caused by I think partly technology and by having too much information and too much news. And then now you have literally plague, pestilence, and famine. Just that, and just that course, just that trinity, plague. Yeah. Pestilence and famine. It could be the title of a future book that some ethnographer or anthropologist or historian would write. And then, you know, you and I were fortunate enough to have this conversation in the sidelines and to try to wonder about its meaning. And thankfully, I have health insurance right now. And thankfully, I have enough food in my house. But you know, every time I get a package, I, I really think to myself, I look at the young, trembling person in front of my door, afraid of me, and I'm afraid of him. And then, you know, before I give him a tip or something, 
like I think like, oh my gosh, you had to leave the house today to de- deliver, you know, this packet of books for me <laughs> because I can't stop the world, right? Like, and you need a job and I need you to bring me this book and I'm 51 years old and I've had a liver disease. I don't have it anymore, but I'm vulnerable to getting sick again. So it's, <laughs> I just can't believe this, you know, very, very tenuous connective tissue that binds us in our society. And yet I'm on the side of safety. Like, and I could indulge in asking these questions. You know, I, I, I often think about all of that. I, and I think about the fact that I really stopped counting my blessings because they're, they're just too many. And you, you yourself have, have, have delved in in your work you've always been so interested in 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 workers in why we work how we work the necessity of work learning that from your very humble upbringing in the sense of what your father and mother did and do are they alive yeah are they alive they are alive they're alive and they're safe and they're living in new jersey and i haven't seen them in over almost two months because I can't visit them because they're vulnerable and none of us really understand if we're shedding virus, right? And every point of contact that we have, so I, w- I don't own a car and I don't know how to drive. So my husband and I are thinking maybe we should rent a car and then drive there and, and <laughs> you know, to see if they're okay. And of course we're thinking, well, if we take the subway to get the car and then we deal with the car and we get to my parents' house, then it's at least, I don't even know how many points of contact because every single subway ride is a gathering of 50 people. So you can cover yourself head to toe, but apparently the virus can even go on your eyelashes. Did you know that? I, I have to say that I didn't know, but I've, I've learned so many facts or what seem like facts in the last two weeks. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, we just we just don't know, and and you know, I'm 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 curious. You you have written so beautifully about um, ways in which um, you feel yourself to be a fake anthropologist or a, a, a fake. Oh yeah, a fake. I'm a fake academic. A fake, well, <laughs> well, you know, um, I remember in those in those years when I was a pretend scholar. It went with the tur- right. it went with the turf. You always felt fake. You always felt like you were, you know. I I kept wondering, you know, but when will I be found out? But what kind of? I mean, I I'm I'm wondering now. I I know you're in the middle, or maybe at the end of writing your, your third the third part of your trilogy. I think called American Hagwon, and I'm I'm mm-hmm. I'm, wond- I'm wondering, um, you know, looking at the the world as it is now. Um, and this pandemic, uh, as it's going on now, not knowing when it will will end, what kind of fake ethnography, and you might explain what you mean by that, would you write about this moment if you were to write about this moment at all? Well, I feel like with, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how we as writers approach this period because it will be a pre and a post pandemic, right? And everything is colored by it. So even if if you publish the work, any work, an essay, a story, a poem, or it, let's say you make a, a piece of artwork, visual art after this experience, even if you are referring to a moment before, you're still colored by the knowledge of the devastation that's occurring with not without a clear end date. So one of the things I really admire about anthropologists, especially those who are really in the trenches, is their profound sympathies in the way they observe and they participate in the lives of other people and also in studying culture. So right now, I think all of us are in this brand new culture of a world with a plague. And all of us are changing in the experience. So in a way, all of us are observing and all of us are participating in it. Um, And then somehow we're supposed to make something out of it if we are creative people perhaps perhaps right perhaps and i think um the thing that i'm really interested in because i'm so interested in work is economics right and i see right now i see so much cruelty i mean it's 
unfathomably cruel what people are doing because of money and because of organizations and our unwillingness to admit how many of these decisions are based on money, not, and of course, like being so short sighted about money and profit, we're actually um, spending more money in the future against the next generation. So I think if I was a millennial, I would be furious. (laughs) If I was a generation Z person, I would be even more furious because I don't know how they're going to climb out of the amount of money that we're spending foolishly. Like, we didn't have to have this kind of problem in America. We didn't. Like, we could have, you know, isolated, separated, had contact tracing, had greater testing. We could have made private companies in America, because there are so many companies in America, which could have been forced to make testing. And as if we are in wartime, and we refuse to do that. Um, and now the horses have left the barn. It's too late. Like, you can't do contact tracing now. Like, you can't. Like, if I was sick, you know, you can't take me out of my house now because we have decided that it's not okay. But in other countries, that was possible. And although that seems incredibly cruel, in some ways, it's incredibly humane. You know, I heard you say, what if, as if we could have, um, right, it's all conditional. And <laughs> no, it, it really is. And, and the world could be different. And, and one, of the, one of the effects of this pandemic is to show us that the environment can look differently. I find myself, you find yourself in Harlem, I find myself in Los Angeles, where all of a sudden you, you, see, you see the sky in a completely different way. Um, you you see what the world could and perhaps might look like if we were perhaps more reasonable. I mean, that's a that's a side um, of this pandemic that points. I I always talk, quoting Gershom Sholem, the idea of shards of hope. Ah, I mean, gosh, like right now, I will take one shard of hope. I'll give you one. Be- <laughs> I'll, 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 well, I am. Well, I'll give you one. I am obliged. Thank you. I, I think I need that, and I feel like I keep. You know, I think you know. I went. I went to the Bronx High School of Science, which is a specialized public high school in New York, and it's public, but it focuses a lot on math and sciences. And I was the humanities kid there, just completely uh, overwhelmed by the brilliance of my fellow students. And, but one of the things that it really taught me is that I never dismiss math and science. Like I never do just because like, I know how hard and creative it is. It's actually really innovative. And in order to think of new ways to solve problems, you often have to be significantly more creative than what most people think of, let's say as fiction writers. So, but I'm just mentioning this because I can't get over just the sheer numbers of people who are losing their jobs. I can't think of, and, and the numbers of people who are exposing themselves to the virus because they have no choice. And then we're fully aware in places like Los Angeles and in New York City and in cities in general where people are living in such close quarters where it's impossible to separate or to impossible to have their own bathroom. And we know all of this. And we even understand how far aerosolized um, particles can actually travel in the air for 26 feet. So forget this idea of six feet. So we, we know all this. And yet, and we know that, you know, X number of people based on certain, you know, models can die. And yet we still have to have hope and we still have to feel a sense of love because just despair is insufficient. Like, it is, it's impossible to only feel a sense of despair. And certainly as a parent, it would be truly irresponsible. And certainly as an adult, it would be irresponsible to not give the next generation a sense of hope. So we need a truly created sense and a collective sense of hope and to gather all the shards and to say, it's not beautiful, but here we go, (laughs) because we have to struggle better. Having children, when when, one thinks about, you know, what what world we're, we're passing on. Um, what what legacy? Um, yeah, and also what ladders and rules and um, models and and also all of our apologies. 
Like, right. I think one right, of the things, right, right. like, Tell like how, how can that. I admit, right? Like how, how, how much have I fucked up? Like, I'm <sighs> so sorry. Like how, how much have we done wrong? Because in a way I think people like when I, every, when you look at social media, very often young people, especially I've noticed Gen Z and young millennials talk about gaslighting. You know, this whole idea that from that film, that movie, I think it's Ingrid Bergman, right? It's, and this whole idea that, oh, people feel like they were lied to. And then I think, you know what? You're right. You were lied to. You are being lied to. Constantly. And a part of us, even if, right. And then I think in a way, what we have to do is say that it is happening. Like, we're not going to make that even worse. We're not going to um, double down and say what you think and what you perceive is inaccurate. So a part of me feels like, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry this is happening to you and to me, but, and also I'm sorry if I participated in it because how could we possibly offer hope? It would just be false. It's kind of like when people see thoughts and prayers. It's just garbage yes, at yes, that point. Yes. But, you know, I often think using the medical example, if you're sick, Minjin, and, yeah. and you go and see a doctor, and I know that you've, uh -huh. you've struggled with, with illness that I, 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 I gather now, is no longer such a struggle as when you were in your 20s and 30s. But when, if you're sick and you see a doctor and the doctor tells you you're fine, there's no hope. No. So, so in a way, the diagnosis for our, you know, the, the jokes you need to tell over the dinner table to your son are necessary, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you, you, um, realism is kind of, uh, is what is needed is what is needed so badly um and and we can't we can't coat this moment but we can we can still think you know the, what brecht said you know in these dark times will there be singing yes there will be singing about these dark times yeah yeah and there have been moments of singing and daydreaming in dark times throughout history and yeah. that is true even in the gulag people still dream and fall in love. It's the one, so, it's the one we, thing you can't take away from us in, in some sense. And I think one of the things... Which is so beautiful. It is beautiful. I'm, I'm uh, on, on a darker subject, which I must add. <laughs> yeah, uh, let's go to a darker yeah, subject. Yeah, you, you know, pe 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 pestilence was not enough, right? Plague was not enough. <laughs> Uh, so let, 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 let's, you know, uh, make, between catastrophe and tragedy, let's go deeper. Uh, the racism. The, the racism now, I am here for it. Yeah, I am yeah, here for I it. I know, I know. 1-800-MIN-JIN-LEE uh, um, and you'll have Dr. Yeah. The, the, racism against, the racism against Asian Americans in this time of pandemic um, it, it, yeah. it must strike you. It must strike you to the core, I would imagine, um, the way in which, I, you know. I am. Go ahead. Sorry. I, I'm so hurt. I'm so hurt by it. And I'm also hurt for my students uh, in college who are experiencing it. And then I also, one of the things that I recognize, because I teach uh, young writers, and some of them who seek me out especially are Asian American young writers because they're because they never see people like me in in colleges and they're like oh my god look at you you're a unicorn so and then one and then they're they're very frank when they write their essays and their stories and then one of the things i'm so surprised i think maybe it's because i'm generation x and i'm 51 years old is the younger people are very um surprised by racism because often depending upon where they grew up they were kind of told that they weren't experiencing racism when they were experiencing racism. They just kind of thought, oh, I can't complain about that because I'm a middle class person. I'm a working class, I'm, I'm, or I'm a ruling class person. I'm like a doctor's child or an ambassador's child. Therefore, this is not happening. But then, of course, very often they don't like themselves. They think that they're ugly or their stories are invalid because they don't feel culturally represented. So there was that train of this bizarre racism that I was noticing as I was teaching my young Asian American students who are so brilliant and like lovely. And, and then, so I was worried about them. And then now they're actually being called out in a very kind of obvious kind of external racism. Like you have brought a disease into this country. So then I have students who are, let's say Korean American saying, wait a second, 
I'm not Chinese. And they're saying stupid things because that's not the point. Like no one should be saying any of this. Even if you were Chinese American, you didn't bring this disease into this country. So watching that happen, and then of course seeing the the incredible rise of physical violence right. against Asian Americans in Vi- the United States. Violence. And you're in LA. Yeah. Um, it, I'm really angry. Like I'm really angry. I'm not just that. I'm angry. And I don't even know what I'm going to do if someone tries to put stuff on me because... I wouldn't want to be I don't, around. I wouldn't want to be around. Yeah, yeah. you really, wouldn't want to be around. No, I really wouldn't. <laughs> I really, kn- um, knowing you as I do a little bit, I really wouldn't yeah. want to be around. But I, I think the vulnerability of this situation and the, uh, the volatility of it is such... Uh, I mean, it's really, it's devastating. I know, Minjin, that in, in closing, you work very, very slowly. And uh, it's something that I, 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 I must say I admire. Um, I always remember the wonderful line of, um, of Benjamin in his essay uh, on the storyteller. He, he quotes uh, Paul Valéry, who says that man no longer works at what cannot be abbreviated. And I know that in so many ways, your 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 manner of working is a slow manner, and I'm wondering now, um, with this pandemic and with what we need to do, what your work habits are, and if the book you you you're going to publish is in the works, and uh, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about about that. Well, thank you, and I hope that you will send that quote to my publisher. I will. I will be grand. I will. Oh, uh, uh, um. just, to, just to say, you know, Min Jin may not have turned in the manuscript, but look at Valérie, look at Benjamin. Right. Then, you know. Right. Yeah, yeah. I will. I will. Um, I will. Actually, I, I'm working on two books, and one is actually a very slender memoir about becoming a person who is willing to assert herself, and that book is called Name Recognition. And it's my exploration of learning how to speak and to argue for things that I believe in. One of the things that I think that my job is to take chaos and make it into cosmos. And that can be said for the world that I create, but it can also be said for the world that I've made for myself. Because I think I had to imagine that it was possible that my stories mattered, the things that I saw in the world, the questions that I had were meaningful because it wasn't like someone told me that they were. It, it was just something that I believed. And I think the reason why I'm so slow is because I'm so certain nobody cares. So I think in order for me to share something with somebody else, one, I have to be asked. Like I couldn't just say, oh, by the way, you know, I'm here. <laughs> I think, mean, oh, no, I have to be invited. And then if I am invited, I must be really, really good. Otherwise, they may ask me to believe. Like, I have that level of anxiety, and that sounds, and I don't mean to sound modest. Like, I really feel that way, and it's, um, it's crazy making. It's not a healthy thing. I don't advise it. And my, my students know how gentle I am because I think making things requires a great gentleness. Um, and, and so I try very so I'm working on this memoir, and then the other book that I'm working on is American Hogwarts, and that is my magnum opus. Like, when I finish that book, Paul, I'm quitting. Like, I'm done. So um, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll revisit yeah. that and, and see if, if, okay. if I, I have a feeling um, that quitting is not, not, exactly, not exactly what you do. Min Jin, I could continue talking to you for such, <laughs> for such a long time, and I, 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 I wish I could, and hearing your laughter uh, even uh, in the midst of of all the grief we're living through is is really a balm and i want to thank you i want to thank you so much uh, for taking oh, my oh paul call. you are, paul you are a tonic for the soul you are well thank you thank you i i'm i'm really grateful to you and and i can't wait to to see you again and uh, for the moment please accept my virtual hug Oh, and I send you one too. And um, I know we will see each other again. And that is my chart. And will. that is my chart of hope. Yeah. We will. I still ha- hang on to it. <laughs> A huge hug. 
I need help to you, Paul. Bye, Tiny. To support this show and DubLab's progressive programming, go to dublab.com/support. Thank you.